Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon, depending on where you are and what time zone you're in. <clears throat> Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, Rule of Law and the New Abnormal. <clears throat> Please remember, this is a time of year where Think Tech asks for those of you who appreciate what Think Tech offers to help Think Tech continue to do that by contributing. Go to the thinktechhawaii.com website, click the donate button, and whatever you're moved to share and contribute is tremendously appreciated. So thanks all very much. So this morning, in no particular order, we have Professor Vanilia Randall, Emeritus from the University of Dayton School of Law, one of the leading scholars on race, racism, and the law, which has become a pretty hot topic with school boards and others at this point in time. David Larson, a highly experienced, respected professional professor at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in St. Paul, chair of the American Bar Association's section of alternative dispute resolution, and a pioneer of the New York Courts online case resolution project, which is expanding access to justice in ways that no one had imagined more than a year and a half ago. Jeff Portnoy, one of our leading not only legal commentators and constitutional commentators and a senior partner at Kate Shuddy, uh, but also a sports commentator, kind of uh, Hawaii's next step up from John Madden. Tina Patterson in Germantown, Maryland. No, not New Jersey. I will not get that wrong again. <laughs> I won't do that. <laughs> Tina has a wide variety of experience in business on entrepreneurship, coaching, mediation, arbitration, domestically, locally, nationally, internationally. Thanks all of you for joining us. <laughs> and We've always been kind of playing these topics um, with a lot of improvisation. And we were just talking about jazz before the show came on. Is there some connection between jazz and what's happening in our society and how we get through this from discord to harmony? Your thoughts? Jeff, you want to start us off? Well, I guess it depends on what era of jazz you want to talk about. There was an era of jazz where all the musicians were in key and all playing together. And it sounded like one piece with various elements. And then there was a period of jazz where the musicians all played what they wanted and hoped that somehow it all came together. And many times it didn't. And many times it was in the uh, ears of the beholder. And I would suggest to this very uh, prominent group that unfortunately we're in the latter period of jazz where everybody is playing their own tune and rarely does it all come together. How's that? Was that profound or what? <laughs> <laughs> I think the ears of the beholder is a good point to make. Because I think the, the instead of if we think about jazz from the I'm not a jazz connoisseur I I like smooth jazz and my kids say that's not jazz and the issue becomes it seems to me that people play what they want but people also like what they want and that there is no amount of of uh, Kind. My kids can't get me to like Theonius Monk. There's, I just don't like it. There, there's nothing you can say, no argument you can make that will get me to like it. And I think maybe that's part of what we need to come to the realization is that we can't talk people into different value systems and liking different things. And I don't know how we deal with that. Uh, when, when, when people have these set likes and dislikes, set values that they think are being um, challenged. Yeah, you know, for, for me, that kind of the jazz metaphor falls apart a little bit. 
because even during periods of time when jazz musicians were playing in ways that were discordant, um, they at least were under, under the impression of playing together, even if the music didn't blend together. And right now we're in a period where we're not playing together. And part of that is because of technology and we all have avenues of communication that aren't connected. So we have people playing whatever they wanna play and they're only reaching their own constituents and we're not coming together in any way. And that's what's frightening. I guess if you could follow this through, and I, I should have said this, people are hearing what they want. We can all sit down in the room and listen to the same piece. And it's not likely that we're all going to have the same impression of what we heard. And I think in the light of these days in social media, people are hearing what they want to hear. And it is many times not what they should be hearing or not what their neighbor is hearing. <laughs> Tina, I hear the wheels turning. <laughs> yes, Tina's gonna do. put on a record, right? <laughs> you, yeah, yes, you do. I, I, I wanna go back to what Jeff said earlier. I, I think that underscores every, every genre of music and jazz in particular, which is what is, what is pleasing to the listener whether it's the, the bass or whether it's the piano um, and recognizing that the sum of those parts is what made the music. Um, and yeah, we can talk about Miles Davis and his solo work and we can talk about Wes Montgomery and his solo work, but we can also think about the trios and the quartets that have performed. And it was cooperation, which is one of the things that I, I think David is alluding to and I would conclude completely agree. It's the, it's the cooperation that is lacking right now um, that is, is both disheartening, but I think could also literally see just separation and, and not working toward, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the word. It's not even agreement, but just a, a recognition that I, I have, I have a right to be here. I have a right to play my guitar, um, whether it's acoustic or electric, I, I'm supposed to be here. I'm keep trying yeah. to keep it musical. <laughs> yeah, no, and I, I, you know, I think many of us believe that our national politics have gotten to a level where it can't go any lower. And I think I was wrong because this last week to have a Republican congressperson put out a video trying to kill a Democratic Congresswoman in an avatar-like sequence is bad enough. And then not to have a single Republican in Congress criticize what he did and for he and his office to kind of just laugh it off. I don't know how much lower we can go in national politics. I, I, I'm not sure. I keep thinking we've hit the bottom, but I, I, I'm wrong. Well, the House, you know, the, part of the problem we have is that people just do verbal criticisms. I mean, it's, it has the House, and I don't know, because I haven't actually been following this particular a prop case. I know of it, but I haven't been following it closely. Has the House actually uh, put up uh, issues of censure him? I don't know the answer. I don't think so, Chuck. Uh, you may have more knowledge about this than I do. Not, not publicly disclosed or known at any rate. And what we're hearing is that you know, if you got a trio or a quartet together, they, they do songs and a song is a collective product, but it's a collective effort. Okay? And there has to be some underlying respect and understanding for that communication to come together as a song rather than just individual conflict. And maybe individual conflict may be the theme of that song, but it still has to be a collective product. And there's no respect for that, that we're seeing in our leadership and at our societal levels. 
But I think the, if we using the music thing as an example, the problem is, is exclusion is essential to playing certain music. I mean, the thing is, is, is that you, the, you don't come together to play a song uh, and uh, if you bring, if you have different forms of music, different people are excluded when their musical style doesn't fit with what people think. And the struggle we have is over the Democrats and Republicans arguing over which musical style is going to control. And who and who gets to sit at the table? And if you're not in, and in the problem, and maybe this as an outsider, it seems to me that that is not new. Uh, even now, they have excluded socialists. They have excluded communists. They have ex they have they have developed rules where you can't, it's very hard for an independent, even on a, um, a, a local level to run because the rules require uh, uh, so much to be able to even get on the ballot and stuff. And so up to now, I think they've been able to harmonize okay, we can work together, Republicans and Democrats, and exclude all these other people. But that process that they've developed is now being turned on themselves. Where you know, the, the one thing, and to expand this a little bit, the one area of our culture that has always been inclusive is music. My father was a trumpet player, played in bands with black and white musicians. You go back and look at old videos of big bands in the 50s, 60s, 70s, you see black and white musicians, small groups, black and white musicians. It seems to me that if you look at culture in any form, the one area that has been inclusive and has combined the two races at the time, the, the predominant two races, it's music. And you don't see that in very many other areas of, of our culture or our politics for that matter. Well, Jeff, I, th I guess I take the exception. I think that I, I wasn't talking about racial uh, uh, no, I know, terms. I know. I'm just pointing. But what out. I'm saying, but my view is, even when you think about music for race, basically what happened is white people stole black music. Uh, it wasn't so much inclusive, except as, for, as opposed to stealing and playing and co-opting. And yeah, there was there would be an occasional black person in in a white orchestra or occasional white person in a black band but i don't know that i think that music was an area to put up for racial for identifying racial harmony well it's true about rock and roll i know a little bit about that and and you're right about uh white music producers stealing black music in the 50s uh, and, and turning those songs into white artists and et cetera, and keeping black performers back then from getting their royalties. But I hear you, but I, I watch a lot of old black and white uh, videos of bands in the 30s and 40s uh, and even moving forward, but you're right about the rock and roll situation. And that's clearly been documented by by so many people and only recently have, I hate to use the word reparations been talked about in, in changing the structure and repaying people for the royalties that they, they never received. But anyway. Now, you're kind of getting back to this idea I was talking about before that you, you weren't coming together and Tina also alluded to it. Um, we're not coming together and playing together. Um, 
You know, I think we're in a period of, of isolation that's maybe unprecedented when you combine the pandemic, when you combine the potential and ability of technology to let us have this kind of screen time, which is a virtual gathering, but it's not a physical gathering, not quite the same. And, um, you know, we have our phones that are very sophisticated. And I don't know if you do, but I spend a lot of time looking at the screen of my phone, which is, which is really quite isolating. Um, and I think millions of people are doing that. They're spending a lot of phone time looking at the screen. So part of the problem in our kind of jazz analogy is that through on the pandemic, through on technology, through on isolation, and, uh, and we really are playing a part. <clears throat> Where are the disconnects coming from that you see underlying communication and cooperation? You know, part of it is, is algorithms. Um, you know, algorithms, I mean, we're getting tracked continually. This whole idea of privacy is no, doesn't even exist anymore. Um, you know, so, so profiles have been built for all of us. And to the degree that we that we receive targeted information now, um, we are all attentive to, to streaming information, you know, and it's it's targeted to us, and we're not getting a lot of diverse voices. We're getting voices that are consistent with what we've approved of and searched for before, and um, and that kind of drives us further into our positions and probably less less open thinking. I would agree with David, and I would take it one step further um, that I'm not going to say it's all technology, but I think technology plays a, a, and, and our isolated state at this point really has opened the door for discrete messaging based on where your the sites you visit, the information you read, um, and other demographic information that is culled from our, our visits uh, and, and how that messaging is repeated over and over and over again, whether it's the ads that appear as we're looking at a site or it's the links to a related article and literally stepping back and saying, okay, is this, is this real? I was listening to a presentation the other day and the gentleman shared how two groups, not even based in the United States, had run back and forth on social media and had told people to show up at a certain site, either pro or against this particular subject. And as it turns out, one, both of these groups were not based in the US, but people actually showed up, never thinking about the legitimacy of the organization or the messaging that was being put forth. They went because it struck a chord with something that they either believed intrinsically or something that they had learned to accept as a truth for them. I think that's one. I think that's a, 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 an excellent point. That what has happened is uh, we have a we are a, na a nation of cults right now because people get their ideas reinforced, and no matter how uh, marginalized their idea may be, they can find a hundred people, a thousand people on the internet that believe the exact same thing and then they get it reinforced because uh, it, you know, they get these messages and they, uh, education, you can't educate people out of cultish values. Uh, and, and so no matter, when you try to say disinformation, they, you become the, so, the source of uh, disinformation because you're saying something that is inconsistent with their value system, inconsistent with what they want to believe. You know, we've always had, this might be a little bit extreme, but uh, we've always had cults, religion is cults. There's no question about it. I, I think the difference now is that because of social media, there are, an exponential number of little mini cults, mm -hmm. and and they they often conflict. So you know when we used to have the Branch Davidians, which were you know 150 or 200 people that just happened to physically hook up. Now all you got to do is push a button, and you'll find 
a, a small group of people who believe in the most extreme views that you want to believe in. So, you know, I, I, I'm not a sociologist and I know people write about this every day and will probably for decades to come, but, you know, the ability of people to, as you just alluded to, find similar people is just a push of a button. It wasn't like that 20 years ago. Right. So what has moved us from any kind of common identity, shared identity, to conflicting identities that are directly hostile, destructively hostile to each other? I think the two-party system. I think it's a political, I think that uh, we have two parties that are cults and we force people to identify with one or the other and 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 it's become all about election all about uh, the the two parties are all about getting reelected and and funding and so I, I I think that if we I actually truly believe that if we had more parties politically we'd have more positive action because people would have that have to work together to come to a decision they couldn't take a winner takes all uh, view of things thoughts on that does that move us toward a win-lose rather than a no, I'm, I'm not sure together? I'm not sure and I know that that's something that Professor Randall feels strongly about, and we've been on many shows where uh, she has espoused that view, and, and I appreciate it. But look at Europe. They're no better, and they're multi-parties. They're six, eight, 10, 12 parties. Their governments can't last for six months. They have the same you know, problems based upon their own politics and culture that we do. Uh, but I, I appreciate you know, the fact that Right now, we just literally have two parties. The question really is, do we have two parties? How many parties do we really have under two names? I mean, just taking the Democrats. We have one party. We yeah. have a capitalist well, party. Yeah, well, that's true. But I mean, just, you know, <laughs> just take the Democrats. There are clearly two parties within the Democratic name. And, uh, and the Republicans, they still had 10 or 12 people, although I gather they're going to be censored, by the way, for voting for the... Uh, Infrastructure right. bills. Did you see that? The 12 Republicans yeah, yeah. who voted for infrastructure are potentially going to be censored. I mean, have we ever had, uh, you know, I throw it out to all of the professors who have had much more academic background than I do. And, you know, I, I know we've had discord in politics, but have we ever had such extreme discord among the major two political parties? I, I can't recall any either from the history books or my lifetime. Well, you know, it's disturbing that kind of iron fist leadership that, you know, if you, if you vary just a little bit, you know, uh, <laughs> good luck up in Alaska because we're going to do everything we can to get you, make sure you're not reelected. Um, you know, and that's, that's particularly frightening when the leadership says that kind of author authoritarian position that you have to follow our, our, our platform, our message, or we're gonna, we're gonna throw you out. Um, didn't, that, didn't that pretty much publicly started with the, Obama, with the Republicans in the Obama administration? Uh, where they pretty much, I mean, they said, our goal is to make sure that he doesn't have a successful uh, presidency. And we're going, we're not going to focus on what is the best bill for our country. We're going to focus on how this will be, how this uh, can be used by Obama in uh, his in terms of re-election, how people, and so they took a stance, they took a stance on bills, they took a stance on judges, they took, which was all, and they had discipline of anyone who wanted to do anything different. And so the Republicans 
have been going down this road of uh, party loyalty first and foremost, so that uh, and using that loyalty to vote against things that would be good for the country uh, for for a long time. They may have even done it. I don't remember. I'm trying to think whether they were that way with Clinton or not, but I'm just real familiar with how they so publicly said it was their goal to make sure that Obama had an unsuccessful presidency. But but are they, and this comes up to the president, I think it's a huge question which deserves a whole show in itself. Are they reflecting the views of the constituents or are they leading their constituents? And I think that's been a major change. Politicians just to lead. Now, clearly in the Republican Party, they're just following, and that's the scary part, that the majority of voters in their district like what they're doing, encourage them to do what they're doing. And that's the scary thing. I don't find an individual representative to be a problem, although there are some really people with serious mental disease in Congress. The real problem is the 51% that elected them and continue to reinforce their views by reelecting them. Authoritarian leaders have been democratically elected. You know, they have, an all, they have not all been coups. You know, so, does, so could that never happen here? It could happen here, sure it could. No, it did happen here, didn't it? Did I miss yeah. something? Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and there's levels, you know. And it's, you know, it could get worse. I'll put it that way. Okay. And in our last minute or so, that whole question of whether we even really have democratic offerings or elections, and what it would take to get there, that's at least another show in and of itself. Just quick straw poll. Would you say our elections are more democratic or less than democratic? How many say I, our elections tend to be more democratic than not? When? And when? When? Now. You mean, you mean <laughs> like in 2022 or 2020? I'll vote for democratic in 2020. I'm voting for not democratic in 2022. Yeah. I'm voting for never democratic. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you look at you know, if you look at the, we've you never at the had a democratic system in voting in this country. Uh, we've also we've always had the facade of democracy. Well, well, if you look at what's happened to state legislators, and if it's a, if it's a comparative question, it's getting worse. I mean, I think there's no question when you look at what's being done at the state level in Republican-controlled legislatures um, that it's getting less democratic. Thank you. Nate, your David. vote? I would agree with David. I think the pendulum is swinging. Um, and I, I've expressed this to you offline, Chuck. I'm concerned about the midterm elections. Um, just voting rights in and of itself um, it is on the line in all 50 states and territories. So yeah, 2022, great concern. Yeah, I agree with Tina that, um, you know, if, if this Congress can, can accomplish one thing above everything else, it's the Voting Rights Act. You, if we can't protect that, if we can't protect democracy, we're gonna lose everything. So and so to... how well do you think the Democrats have been on protecting democracy? They put a bill for it, but they haven't been willing to go whatever mile it takes to get it passed. Now, what I'm saying is, they, is we have to. I mean, that, that has to be our priority. So we're wishful out of thinking, to... wishful ahead, thinking yeah. will always keep us going. Wishful thinking. David, I look what's happened. Where are they going to get that 51st vote or a 50th vote? They don't have it. So we're out of time for today. But once again, we've come back to the point where there are bigger, deeper questions that we're winding up with than we started with. <laughs> come back in two weeks, rejoin us. We're going to deep dive into more of those questions. Please support us and Think Tech Hawaii if you can. Thank you, Chuck. This has been great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. <laughs>